Welcome to the Australian Water School, the home of demand-driven industry design training for the global water sector. Hello and welcome to the Australian Water School's first webinar covering pumped storage hydropower. I am your host, Craig Price, and I am excited to be able to introduce to you some expert presenters today who have some tremendous content to offer to you. First of all, welcome all of our global attendees from around the planet. Um, have a look at the spread here. We are so pleased to have your attendance today, and we really look forward to receiving your feedback after we wrap things up so that we can plan the best content to help meet your needs in the future. I do want to introduce our speakers that we have today from three corners of the globe. We've got Quint in the US, Mark Cordell in Australia, and Mark Wilson in Scotland. Now, uh, Mark Wilson got the raw end of the deal today with the time zones, uh, this time around being stuck with the midnight slot. Um, but um, let's go ahead and have you all just come on and, and say, say hello. Uh, maybe if I could ask one question of um, our presenters and panelists today, if you had to pick a pumped storage project to tour, um, once travel opens back up again for those of us who are still under travel restrictions, which one would you want to see? Where would you want to go? And which one would you want to take a tour of? Let's start with uh, Mark Cordell. Um, tell us where you're coming to us from and let me know which one you would want to see. Yep. Um, my name is Mark Cordell. I'm here in Melbourne in Australia. Um, and in terms of well, there's so many, Cray. I mean, I guess going back to the home, so I can go home back to the original UK, I guess go back down and see Denorick, where I guess um, it's one of the fastest response um, stations in the world. So, yeah, it's um, a great example of pump storage and what it can do. Perfect. Uh, Mark Wilson, um, where, where would you go if you could just throw a dart at a map and, and visit one of these uh, projects that we'll be uh, either talking about today or one that you're aware of. Yeah, no, I think I would like to come and visit your country over in Australia and I'd love to see the how the snowy project's developing and also the Kitson uh, develop project that's uh, commencing in Queensland as well. So two great projects. Awesome. Quint, uh, where are you coming to us from, and uh, where would you like to uh, to visit? Yeah, I'm coming in from the uh, west coast of the United States in the state of Oregon, and uh, there is one project that's just breaking ground here in Oregon. But uh, I've I've been hearing about Loch Ness since I was a child, and I think uh, as soon as that one's done, I think that's the one I would want to go see. There's so many other great things to see in the area as well. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and I think that's one that I would put on my list uh, list there as well. You get to get the familiarity, and you get to see some cool pump storage. So we'll we'll look forward to hearing about that uh, momentarily. Let's have a look at the poll results and just see if there's any um, surprises there. Thanks for uh, for for those um, that, that came in. Um, if we look at this, um, it, it does show that um, you'll, you'll have this come up on your own uh, screens um, if you filled these out. Uh, it looks like most of the uh, attendees are from commercial and consulting. Um, and then the one question that uh, I wanted you to think about, as everybody's sitting around, um, generally sitting, maybe you have a stand-up desk, but if you're sitting at a desk, um, if you had to reach down and raise a four-liter jug, we'll say it's a gallon jug for the U.S. attendees, um, up to the height of your desk, and you just wanted to match what's in a AA battery, how many times would you have to do that? And I will, um, I'll have Quint answer that question uh, later on for you. So it looks like we're pretty evenly divided. Uh, Quint will give us that answer later on. Um, the question about climate change, sounds like most everybody agrees that um, there will be massive effects and um, they will be widespread. And then, um, the general knowledge is uh, probably come in the most for uh, pumped hydro and um, what the memberships are. There's, oh, wow, 50% of the uh, attendees are members of Engineers Australia. So we've got a huge Australian contingent here um, and very few members, uh, relatively few members of the International Hydropower Association. And um, as you look today at some of the things coming in um, that we'll present, um, maybe we'll get some more uh, traffic for the IHA. 
to set the stage for the main presenters, um, we're going to provide you with a bit of background material. And I'll start with the smallest of scales. Um, we've got a ton of content to get through. And usually um, I provide a resources slide um, at the end of a webinar. But in this case, because of how much we're going to be going through, I'm going to pop up some resources at the very beginning so that you can see that everything we're covering, including some of the bits that we're just going to touch on very briefly, will have live links for more information in the accompanying materials. So I have set up this page. Um, it's at surfacewater.biz slash pumped. Um, um, and this is where I'll post the link to the recording as soon as it's available. Um, and I've compiled some conceptual background materials to start us off. Uh, the recordings will be posted here as well, um, along with links to the PowerPoint presentations that you're going to see today. Um, so again, just to set the stage a little bit uh, for the concepts, um, you may have seen if you're off the grid, you may have seen that you could power your mobile phone with a hand crank, or if you're out camping, you could just let the water do the work um, with one of these gadgets. Um, that's because the water is flowing, but what if the water was standing still? If I were to take this little puddle of water right here and try to bottle it up, and if this guy standing here picks up a bottle of water from this puddle and holds it in his hands, how much potential energy is in that bottle? Well, the answer is going to depend on the elevation. And if you look at this little cap right here, it looks inconspicuous, but if you were to pick up the water here, um, you wouldn't have a whole lot of potential energy unless you took the nuts off of this cap. If you took the nuts off of this cap, this happens to be in Russia, it would open up to the deepest hole on earth. You might see this little decimal. Um, they swap it around in Europe, a decimal and a comma. This is not 12 meters deep. This is 12 kilometers deep. So if you had a hole that was 12 kilometers deep and you were holding a bottle of water, well, think about how much potential energy you would have. A grandfather clock with a weight that goes down one meter might go, you know, might power it for a day. But if it went down 12 kilometers, you could probably power it for a lifetime, assuming you had a long enough chain. So this brings us to the Bob Ross of engineering. I'm excited for our very first uh, collaboration here with uh, uh, Clint Crispin. Um, who has constructed a solar, uh, well, it's basically a, a solar battery, um, a solar powered um, uh, pumped hydro station um, on his home in Oregon. So Quint, if um, what I'm gonna do here is just, I'll play this video and um, I'll fast forward it up to the point um, where we can see what you built. And I think this really does a good job, um, very timely, just came out like a week or two ago, um, just in time for us to uh, show you this in this um, presentation. Uh, you can see here, I've just scrolled through a bunch of background. I encourage you to watch this whole thing, but what I'm gonna do here is just pause the video at the point um, where you can see uh, what he has built. And um, then Quint, if you can just walk us through uh, what you put together here, and what you learned in the process. Over to you. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so I have a, I'm an engineer by day and a YouTuber by night, I suppose, evenings and weekends. And I have a channel where I've been for over a year, I've been uh, making videos about science and engineering. And one of the most popular series that I did was actually harvesting hydropower from the rain that was falling on this large section of roof that you see right there. And uh, pe people really liked learning about that. And, and I had, including math and equations on, on how to calculate how much power or energy you could get out of it. But I hadn't yet done a video where I explained the difference between power and energy. And I thought maybe I would do a pump storage project because it really lends itself to that. So what you can see in the picture, that white barrel up towards the top, is as high as I could get anything on my property. And then there's a matching barrel down straight down below it. And there's about a seven meter height difference. And in the States, we would call that a 55 gallon drum or 55 gallon barrel, but it works out to 208 liters. And if you do the math on that, it's something uh, like 14 kilojoules or 14,000 joules of energy. And uh, so what I did, there's a solar panel sitting next to that upper barrel and that solar panel has wires that run down to a pump at the lower barrel so that during the day the you know the sun is up and you can hear the pump very slowly pumping the water from the bottom barrel to the top barrel and it takes about five and a half hours to just as if it was a large reservoir but of course it isn't uh, that is filling that water up and then the sun has gone down at night it's dark outside and down at the bottom, I have a little 3D printed generator that I made as part of my earlier videos. 
that I can just open a valve and have that water then all of that energy released across this turbine. And I hung up a string of lights on that back deck. And you can see that if, if you go watch the video, you can see it in there where I talk about the benefits of pump storage and why you would want that as a way to store that solar. And I figured for the general public, that was a really great way to basically be, it's like you're storing that sunshine in this upper reservoir and then letting that light out at the bottom all without any lithium or any, any special chemical storage. It's all done in the gravitational potential energy of the water. And just for some quick numbers, of course, keeping it really simple, there weren't any special inverters involved. It's all connecting directly with the, uh, with the solar panel connected directly to a little DC uh, motor. So it kept it really simple for everybody to understand, but there's a penalty with that simplicity, which is the efficiency and while the pump was actually using only six watts of the uh, solar power, the actual work that it was doing was less than a watt. So the energy going in was only about 12% with that simple little, uh, simple little DC pump. And then figuring that there were that 14,000 joules, which works out to about four watt hours of energy that was stored in that upper barrel, that as I released it across my generator, I was only getting about a watt for an hour. So basically one watt hour of the four watt hours that were stored in there. So there's 25% efficiency, uh, on, only getting a quarter of the energy actually recovered is actual electricity. So you multiply that 12% going in and the 25% coming out and you're down to 3% efficiency overall for the system. But, uh, but it did, I feel like it articulated really well the concepts of pump storage for people, especially non-technical audiences. Um, and the video, as I, I just checked it, we're just coming up to a quarter million views after just a week. Uh, so it's, it's proven to be very popular. So I'd encourage if you watch it and like it, uh, certainly feel free to share that with anybody else that you think might be interested. And of course I've got as uh, see there on the screen. Oh, yeah, that's right. And I have a second channel where for people, because they'll go in the comments and say, well, this is how many watt hours and getting into the calculations, the, that video, what I learned about pump storage is my smaller channel for people that really want to dive in and get more into those technical details uh, that of course is going to have fewer views than the more popular one. And then uh, lastly there, you, of course, I've got about 20 videos on that larger channel that uh, are, goes from harvesting power from rain gutters and all the little, there's several videos on that and some wind power stuff in there. Uh, just about anything that somebody interested in engineering might like to watch. <laughs> that is awesome. And again, we're excited to have this um, kind of talent uh, on board um, with us today. Um, thanks so much for coming on, Quint. Um, Quint will be available to answer your questions in the background um, as we continue. So do subscribe to uh, to these videos. Uh, again, millions of views on some of these. And it just shows you that you know people are looking for this kind of content. Um, I will be introducing here then and turning it over to Mark and Mark. I guess um, with two Marks here, it makes um, uh, Quint, and I, uh, Quint and I the uh, funky bunch here. But uh, what we'll do is step through some of the documents that are out there at the moment. Uh, very timely release just um, last month. Um, some of these documents were released and we're going to see some of that in uh, Mark's presentation. The former... Um, Prime Minister of Australia um, opened up uh, the World Hydropower Congress with some statements and exchanges with Tony Blair. Um, Malcolm Turnbull is um, the co-chair of the International Forum on Pump Storage Hydropower and um, has been involved in some of the uh, projects that we'll be featuring today, including Snowy 2.0. Um, we'll have some links to that for you here. Um, we are excited then after uh, uh, Mark Cordell's uh, presentation to have Mark Wilson step us through uh, um, Nessie's new, uh, well, Nessie's original habitat here, and we'll get a get a feel for an actual project. All the links uh, that you'll see in the presentations I'll include here as well, including an atlas of potential sites from this algorithm including some. I didn't think there'd be any in Western Australia where I'm at. Um, it's pretty flat here, <laughs> much like the flatlands don't have a lot of potential um, for uh, this, this technology. But you can see here, you know, zoom in, uh, take advantage of it. Uh, zoom in on around your place and see, are there any in your neighborhood? Um, have a few more links here for you as well. Um, in this one here, the uh, hydraulic modelers uh, may 
take note of this uh, one Tom Sock reservoir here, which is a pump storage project. Um, and note that um, this is the swath from a dam breach uh, wave, because uh, I think at some point the pumps failed to turn off, there was no emergency spillway, and the entire dam failed and had to be rebuilt. So the reason I mentioned that, um, this is not a magic bullet. Um, it's not the end all. This is one tool we have at our disposal that still has a lot of potential, but there are environmental issues. There are political issues. There are economic issues. And as basic as the concepts are, like we saw today, um, these are there are some hugely complex engineering issues as well. You're going to see some innovative approaches in both Mark's presentations. Um, some of these hadn't been thought of just a few years ago. And if you can imagine, you know, with a couple thousand people who are going to watch this webinar, um, imagine the collective efforts of all of us uh, putting our thinking caps on. We've got huge problems. You know, power demands are going up and we've got to get the emissions down. So can we come up with a solution? Um, let's think this one through. I mean, like really let's, let's think this through um, as a, a collective part of the industry here. If we have another webinar like this 10 years from now, guarantee there's gonna be some idea for energy storage or power generation that we hadn't thought of yet in 2021. So if we can um, think about this and uh, you know keep these Q and A questions coming, save the planet one small step at a time with uh, some of these ideas. Uh, with that, we'll turn it over to uh, Mark Cordell uh, to summarize the recent publications. If you wanna come on and share your screen and we'll learn a bit about what went on at the World Hydropower Congress last month and where we are heading as an industry. So over to you, Mark. Thanks, Craig. Good, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for some of you. My name is Mark Goodell. I'm Stantec's Practice Lead for Downs and Hydropower in Australia and New Zealand. Welcome all. I think last count we had something like 33 countries being represented by, by you all. So yeah, certainly reach, spreading that knowledge today. What I wanted to do go through today was raised sort of like the crisis within the energy crisis, which was voiced by Malcolm Turnbull um, during his open remarks at the launch of the key reports and recommendations of the International Forum of the Pump Storage Hydropower. That launch was made at the World Hydropower Congress about three weeks ago and ahead of um, COP26, which is being held in Glasgow next month. As Cray mentioned, uh, Mr. Turnbull was speaking as the co-chair of the forum, a position he shared with um, Ms. Kelly Speaks Backman, who's the acting secretary, the assi acting assistant secretary of the US Department of Energy. Um, so I wanted to just take the opportunity today, seeing it was timely launched a couple of weeks ago, um, to introduce you to the forum and a very brief overview of what the working groups were up to and, and the reports that they um, have published um, may be interesting to you. So crisis within the energy crisis, what would uh, Malcolm mean by that when he said that? Um, climate change is obviously a regular topic of conversation these days, and especially um, we're seeing it in the news already with um, COP26 um, coming up. Um, around 70% of the world economy is covered now covered by net zero targets, and the energy transition is central to achieving these targets. Unfortunately, Australia is kind of lagging behind the rest of the world in, in these policy um, aspects, but I'll leave that debate to others. Um, but hopefully, um, but we are seeing here, particularly down here in Australia, a significant um, increase in variable renewable energy, which um, both are a rooftop and a um, utility scale um, here down here in Australia. In um, 2019, South Australia was sitting about here and only second behind Denmark for the amount of penetration. So it's a real problem for us here. And why is it a problem? As it's been mentioned, when the sun stops shining, when the wind stops blowing, that power generation drops off and we have instability in the energy sector. So pump storage is often referred to as the batteries, um, the biggest batteries in the world, but I also view them as a, a stabilizer, a regulator for the, for the electricity market it has an important role. Batteries do certainly have a um, play to, a role to play in the future energy mix, but it's long duration that will be needed and, and going forward. So what are we doing as an industry um, to address this? 
In November 20, the International Forum on Pump Storage was launched. Um, it was an initiative of the International Hydropower Association and primarily chaired by the US Department of Energy, but um, as we said about the co-chairs already. The initiative brought together about 13 governments and over 70 odd organizations covering all broads of um, the spectrum. So research, development, um, consultants like myself, um, the funding agencies, um, constructors, and um, even the, the um, machine operators and manufacturers and suppliers. So it came, covered the, the full spectrum. And the mission was really to provide that multi-stakeholder platform um, to provide some um, guidance of what the future might be with pump storage and also expand and transfer the best practice and experience um, so we, we better understand how, how we can contribute. And it was done through the formation of three working groups and um, Stantec was involved in all three of them, although um, we, and we've been sort of like acknowledged for contributions in both the sustainability through Scott Craig Scott in our UK um, business and myself in the um, capabilities, cost and innovation working group. So just quickly going through these, um, and I apologize in advance, there's quite a few words on these slides, but, so, but um, I won't go through all of them. But in the policy and market um, frameworks, the key issues is that not all the services um, provided by pump storage are financially recognized. So it becomes a challenge for investment. Um, and of course, investment um, decisions need the surety of the revenue streams. So what do we need to do in terms of the policy market frames to help incentivize the, um, the, the different um, the investment, not just in greenfield, but also brownfield um, pump storage development. And part of the working group's um, objectives, as you can see there, was to develop country and regional specific policy recommendations for those um, for governments and the regulators to de-risk the development of pump storage. And again, I won't go through all of these um, recommendations, but as you can see, it was really urging um, policymakers to put pump storage in in the forefront and considering now, because if we don't start putting um, plans in place to um, develop pump storage now to meet the needs in the future, um, the duration these projects take to get off the ground is a lot more, um, is quite considerable. Um, even when they're fast tracked, it can be, can take up to five, six years at times, um, depending on the project. Um, obviously, sustainability is another common conversation that we always we have, and has been in the, um, a visible corner stone in the hydropower and dams industry since the World Commission of Dams report in 2000. Um, and the objective of the, the working group was really to promote and deepen the uh, a wider understanding of pump storage sustainability profile. Um, and through that highlight, the tools that are already available through the um, hydropower sustainability um, gap analysis tool and how that can be applied to pump storage. Um, again, a number of recommendations, I won't go through them in, in detail, but again, um, pump storage can be a, a key enabler for that clean energy um, transition. And although, um, well, all pump storage projects are site specific, they are unique, but the tools do allow us to provide a, a good um, assessment of the um, sustainability needs and, and requirements. Um, Finally, the final working group was actually split into two, um, one providing comparison of the pump storage um, against other energy resources and how the costs and the capabilities relate, 
and also then providing summaries of different pump storage technologies that are being developed. And it's these that I thought would be more perhaps interesting to go through quickly with you um, to give you an understanding of what's what's happening. Retrofitting and upgrading is also a, um, a key area. To open pit mines, um, that's a picture of the two pits that are being developed for the Kidston project. Um, this was a particular technology brief that I was um, the lead author on um, and is a key area of interest. Um, we're developed. We're looking at um, a number of opportunities throughout Australia um, in utilising um, mine pits for pump storage schemes. Um, again, um, there's an example of a scheme in Bendigo in Victoria in Australia that is looking at um, developing a 30 megawatt pump storage scheme using an old mine um, shafts. And I'll, I'm conscious of time, so I won't go through, but the Obermeyer pump tire buying is something that might be worth looking at um, as it um, really reduces the space needs for um, the powerhouse um, and could be a cost-effective solution, but it is a technology that's still in development. Um, and finally, the, there was a, a whole host of hybrid systems combining not just um, pump storage by itself, but combining with batteries um, in a modular system and also um, reverse osmosis and obviously solar. There's an interesting one there that may be worth looking at um, for some of you. It's a thermal pump storage, a hot water pump storage in a closed loop system, which um, is, is an interesting one. I appreciate it's a very rush run through, but the the reports are available online um, for downloading. Um, and if you're interested, I'd encourage you to go ahead and read and keep you, keep you um, busy at night um, having a good read of those. Um, so thank you and I apologize for the brevity of it, but um, obviously there's plenty of um, topics for future presentations in their own rights there. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mark. And we'll get uh, Mark Wilson to start sharing his uh, his screen now. But um, yes, uh, what I did want to mention is that um, we can take any of these topics, these subtopics and turn them into, um, you know, more detailed webinars or courses um, and other resources. So when you leave, um, if you need to leave um, uh, be before we get to the end, uh, do not leave without filling out the poll question at the end, which is going to ask you what you want to see more of. And so if there's certain aspects of what you're seeing here that you'd like to see more uh, detail on do let us know um, in your feedback and uh, we'll try to try to cater for that so again keep those questions coming in the background over to you mark wilson thank you very much uh yeah so mark wilson i'm the ceo of the ili group and uh thank you first to australian water school for asking me along today so yeah what i'm going to hopefully achieve is give you a, a bit of an overview of of why we're doing pump storage in Scotland and uh, a little bit about our, our most advanced project, Red John, uh, which is located at Loch Ness. So what I'll do first, I'll just give you a, a brief overview of uh, our company. We are seen as a clean energy development company uh, and we're focused primarily now on energy storage and most of our projects are in Scotland or the north of England. What we do as a company is we get project development ready. Now, what I mean by that is, first of all, we'll go out and we'll find the, the correct location. And then what we'll do is we'll sign up all the necessary land rights. We'll get the planning consents, all the necessary grid uh, uh, consents that are required. Everything we'll package up and then we'll put it into basically a, a company that can then be taken forward uh, and construction can start. Uh, at the moment, uh, we've got over two gigawatts of pump storage, three major projects, and uh, over a gigawatt of utility scale battery storage. What we deem as utility scale is sort of 50 megawatts plus. And we're also looking at green hydrogen over the coming period. Uh, over the last year, uh, we've seen a high demand for battery storage. Five of our projects have now been funded. And as I say, our most advanced project, Red John, it's 450 megawatts 
that just achieved planning uh, in June this year. So uh, why are we why are we doing it? Um, and and the reasons behind it. Well, if there's anything positive to take out of COVID, uh, over the last year or so, we've seen low electricity demand. And in the UK, uh, the electricity production has been dominated by renewables. And we see that this has really given the industry and all of us a glimpse into the future. Speaking for the UK, carbon emissions due to this has been at a record low, but balancing costs have increased significantly. Now, what I mean by that is, as Mark said, is when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, you have to use other technologies. And at the moment, it's usually carbon-based technologies like coal and gas, which is what we're trying to wean, away, wean ourselves away from. And you'll all have seen there's a lot of stuff going on at the moment. Just recently in the US, you've seen a risk of security of supply where there have been blackouts in California and major power outages in Texas. Now, what we know is if we can get additional flexible pump storage generation onto the system globally, it's going to allow more renewables onto the system. It's going to reduce those costs and balancing the grid, and it's going to give us all security of supply. So there's lots of positives. There's strong evidence. Jacobs brought out a report recently that the level of more storage that's needed and how pump storage can be delivered at the lowest cost, at the largest scale, and for the longest duration. A lot That's unfortunately the number one thing uh, most governments will look at is cost. And it's demonstrated that pump storage can go for the lowest cost. Lifetime for a pump storage project can be over 100 years, which is just fantastic. Um, again, as Mark mentioned, policy reforms needed uh, in the in the UK. I can speak for is what's happening now is they've just brought out a call for evidence for long duration storage, and uh, what's really needed here, and I believe in most countries, is what's called a cap and floor. And what that is is it means you have a floor price and you have a cap price. Now, due to the the level of capital cost for a project. Red Jordan's going to cost somewhere in the region of 550 million uh, sterling to build. With a floor price, what it does is it gives investors confidence to put that front end money in. It's going to take five years to build that project out. These projects stand on their own two feet. They don't need subsidized, but they do need that initial support by government to get them built. And there's countries, it's mo it's happening. It just needs to happen quicker. So as well as decarbonisation, which will come on to the sort of numbers, you've got security of supply. There's lots of cost benefits. As, as I say, it's the cheapest form of energy storage at the moment. Um, but what it can also do is these are massive infrastructure projects and it's going to create well-needed economic boost as we come out of COVID. You've seen it in history. Uh, came out of the Depression. In America, they built things like the Hoover Dam. It's big national infrastructure projects that usually is what happens when you come out of a, a depression or, or something as bad as a pandemic or, or the likes. For, for the UK, for example, there's over five gigawatts of pump storage projects in the pipeline. There's ourselves, SSE are doing a big project, Drax, Baclue, and a, and a number of others. Those projects are going to, capital cost is going to be well in excess of 5 billion sterling. 70% of these projects are construction. So that means that roughly 3.5 billion is going to be injected into the economy. Now that's going to be a stimulus as we come out, as we come out of COVID. So it's, it, there's just so many pluses. Now this is a, an overview of our Red John project. Now, yeah, hopefully you can see my cursor. Now, what you're looking at here is the upper head pond, uh, which is going to be man-made. And then down at the uh, left-hand side, this is Loch Ness. And underground is all the tunnels and the turbine, the cavern with the turbines, etc. Now, at, at this inlet-outlet point, 
when there's excess energy on the grid, and this is all going to, is coming now in the UK from onshore wind, and there's going to be a lot more with offshore wind. This is like an enabler to allow more renewables on. But when there's excess energy, at the moment, what sometimes happens is turbines are switched off. So that energy is wasted, and it also costs the consumer money. Rather than that happening, what will happen is, the excess energy will be used to power the water from the from lo the lower head res reservoir up through the tunnels up to the upper head pond, and that's where it's stored. And then when there's energy needed onto the grid, the water is basically like goes. You hit a button, the water goes down the tur the tunnels gra through gravity at force through the turbines and creates electricity. Is that simple, and that can be repeated time and time again. So, just some points on Red John itself. I say it's located at Loch Ness, which is obviously a, a, a very famous location. Uh, there's 450 megawatts of installed capacity, uh, and it's got 2,900 megawatt hours of storage capacity. That means it'll pump at full power for over six and a half hours. We see the configuration as three 150 megawatt fixed turbines. Uh, and we're also going to have 50 megawatts of utility scale battery alongside it. As I say, we just recently achieved planning consent and we've got a grid connection for 2027. So we want to see it built and operational uh, by that date. Uh, some of the more benefits of the project. Um, Say we're going to be bringing hundreds of millions of pounds into the into the area and the local area. This project we've calculated that it will save over its lifetime four hundred and four sorry forty five million tons of CO two, which is huge. We're doing a lot of positives in the area. I mean, Loch Ness is a as a very uh, it's, it's an area that you would some people would be surprised we were able to get a pump storage project but as you'll see shortly it's very non-intrusive but we've gone above and beyond and this is what we hope to see all over the world is in the area itself there's a lot of commercial forestry now when that's cut down it's like a it's like a scar in the landscape what we're doing is we're going to replace that with indigenous trees so over a period of time that whole area is actually going to improve uh, visually, um, we're going to enhance ancient woodland and we're going to create new wet wetlands. So a lot of positive things environmentally. Uh, for the local uh, tourism, we're going to uh, give them their, our jetty once we're finished with it so they can have water taxis there for tourism, etc. And we also support the local football team, which we're very proud of. And what that's doing is Two things, it's supporting the community, but it's also we're using a bit of the land, their land for a park and ride. There's going to be about four, a four workforce of about 450 uh, coming in daily to work to build this project out. So rather than having the, the, the roads full of cars and vans on a daily basis, we listen to the local community because that was a real concern for them. So what we're doing is we're going to bus everybody in daily um, from that location in Inverness, uh, where the football stadium is. And that's really, um, really taken on board what the, the local people were concerned about. And then just because we can, uh, we've enhanced, we're gonna enhance walkways, cycle routes. We're gonna do a lot for tourism. There's a bit of historic stuff we've found up there that we're gonna focus on and just improve the whole culture of the area. So it's all positive stuff. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to show you a video of Red John itself and uh, should give you a really good representation of what the project is going to look like once it's complete. This is the Red John Pump Storage Hydropower Project. The plentiful waters of Loch Ness can be used to help the deployment of more renewable power and therefore reduce our carbon emissions. When there is excess electricity on the national grid, water will be drawn into the underground tunnels to supply the pumps and send the water up to the head pond. 
here, the water will be stored as potential energy until the demand for electricity is such that it needs to be released back through the turbines into Loch Ness. With the UK's remaining coal plants closing by 2025, coupled with the increase in generation from intermittent renewables, pump storage hydro can help fill this gap and balance the grid. As a long-established technology, pump storage hydro provides over 90% of the world's energy storage, with Scotland's two existing plants at Crook and Foyers having been in operation for over 40 years. The main compound, located between the head pond and tail pond, will consist of tunnel portals to access the underground turbine cavern, an electrical switching station and a control building. Given the legacy of hydropower and the electrification of the Highlands in the past, we hope it can play just as important a role in the future. So that's us, uh, and I'm, I'm sure you agree just watching the video there. Uh, visually, uh, it just blends in with the landscape. And just something that demonstrates that is just yesterday, uh, we are, we've been, the Red John project is uh, in the finals of the Green Energy Awards for Scottish Renewables as a sustainable development. So that to me is just, just fantastic for us. So we're, we're extremely proud of that and let, let's hope we win. But thank you very much for your time. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks, Mark uh, Wilson. What I'll let you do as we as we come on here, uh, we have Mark Cordell uh, turning on your video. Um, let me just show you again one of the things that um, I encourage everybody to do here. Make this a little uh, interactive with the audience. Um, have a look um, that uh, th this this link here. Um, I'll post this in the chat line and uh, try zooming around and find your neck of the woods here um, and uh, and and see where are the pump storage uh, potential. Where is the potential um, for pump storage in your area? And what I'll do. Uh, right now is turn it over to Mark Cordell for a few questions that you've answered. And then uh, Quint, keep in mind if you've seen any uh, things come in um, that you wanted to answer as well, let's have you go after uh, Mark Cordell. Mark uh, Cordell, over to you for um, any that you wanted to highlight. So Jonathan raised the one about climate change and droughts. I mean, yes, it does put a, a, a challenge to us, but I mean, and we are developing and designing pump storage schemes taking in the um, climate change and impact of droughts on them. I mean, Lake Onslow would be a good example of almost drought proofing um, the, um, the, the energy market. I mean, the whole purpose of Lake Onslow will be to provide that energy storage available during drought years um, for New Zealand, um, which is predominantly um, reliant on conventional pumped hydro, sorry, conventional hydropower schemes, which would be affected in terms of available output during drought, periods of drought. So, I mean, there is actually a, a clear role that pump storage has to help drought proof um, some, of the, some of the markets that are out there. Right. Um, thanks for that. Um, let me just hit uh, two of these real quick that I saw um, relative to the uh, mining industry in Western Australia. Uh, somebody asked the question, what is uh, one of the challenges there? And uh, my answer, and you may have uh, more to add, um, but uh, typically where the mines are, at least here in Western Australia, you're nowhere near the population centers. Um, so that's that's uh, one, one issue. Somebody else asked about sedimentation. Um, and luckily in the upper reservoirs, since those can be offline, um, you wouldn't have as much sedimentation uh, issues um, as you would in a typical inline system, but you still, for any lower reservoir, uh, would still need to consider uh, some of those issues around where uh, pumps are and intakes are located. Um, so that is a concern. Um, one main question that came up that uh, has been upvoted a bit is um, it deals with the um, cost and benefits um, of a pump storage project and what what figures in and that's a pretty loaded uh, lo loaded question. Um, Mark, um, any others that you wanted to hit before we turn over to Quint and then Mark Wilson? Um, well, just picking up on the mine one you mentioned. I mean, as with any pump storage scheme or any hydro scheme or energy scheme for that matter, 
proximity to load center is is a key question. I mean, mines will often have power lines um, um, to them, um, although some of the Western Australian ones are very remote, so are almost island systems. Um, but it's it's not even though you've got a power line going to the, the mine site or close to the mine site, that can often then be a constraint to what you might then be able to develop um, the pump storage scheme to without doing major infrastructure um, upgrades to the transmission network. Um, so, I mean, there was a South Australian project that I was involved with where the initial views of the sizing of the scheme was very much driven by the the transmission line constraint that it had. Um, so there's a lot of factors to be um, factored into them, but there's potential there. It's just um, a question of whether the, whether the investment decision can be made um, with the surety of, of revenue streams. And unfortunately in Australia, our policies and frameworks aren't and mature enough to to strongly support that in my view anyway yeah no thanks for that um quint um a couple I, I mean this is a question i have but you can you can comment on anything you've seen coming in on the uh on the q a line um but um you know we saw that it's probably not practicable or pra practical um, at a uh, residential scale. Uh, and I'd be curious on your guess. Uh, and also, we need the answer to that question in the poll uh, from you. Um, so what scale, you know, how many homes would you need if you had a whole community? You know, at, at what point do you, do you think, in your opinion, would it become uh, practical and, uh, knowing what you know about what you've built uh, at your home? And then comment on anything else you've seen coming on the chat line. Oh, as far as minimum size to, to justify an actual pump sport. Oh boy. Yeah, that would be uh boy, that that would be need to be a sizable population center, of course. And that that was the the conclusion of or one of the conclusions of the video that I did that though you can get this micro hydro or maybe call more appropriately pico or nano hydro uh with with this, that 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 large barrel on my roof, even though it's so big and and so many kilograms of, you know, hundreds of kilograms of, of weight up there that it's still only at that seven meter height is only equivalent to a, a single double A battery yes. that, uh, and it's just because of the, the energy density of pumped hydro just requires these massive reservoirs to work. But the, the advantages are clear when you have the topography and, and everything's, everything's correctly there. So yeah, it's going to be, I'd probably have to do some some back back of the napkin math, but I, I would think you know a hundred thousand. Well, you know it just depends. Certain areas are going to be more conducive to that. I have uh, the in in my family there's property with a pond that I'm considering. You know, there, there, <laughs> what what could be done there with some hundreds or you know five hundred watts just as some uh, some some emergency power kind of thing. I, I think one of the questions that one of the early questions that came up in the chat there that I saw was you know drought conditions, what do we do with, with pumped hydro where there isn't enough water around? And one of the things that I came across studying pump hydro is that it's, it's a very site specific thing where you look at the, the height and the water availability and the demands and you, you know, you wouldn't pick a giant turbine for a smaller size, you know, th things have to be sized for the demands in the area. And then of course, if water isn't available, then as uh, as Cray was saying towards the beginning, pump storage is not the only answer and it won't solve everything all by itself. So it's a large component of it. It's the largest stored energy by far, the largest uh, component of stored energy in the world right now. And we've got all these other technologies that will supplement it of the compressed air. And certainly you can find atmosphere, even if the atmosphere weren't breathable, it'd be something you could compress to be able to store there and the mechanical storage. So you just have to look at the site and look at the, the things that are available. And there are certainly plenty of other al uh, of alternatives to uh, going with lithium and more chemical battery technologies. 
Yeah, thanks. So um, the answer to the poll question, then, um, oh, yes. I, I say that sometimes, um, you know, people will power up uh, their TV with a bike or something, you know, and, 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 and you can get some exercise with as much time as I spend in front of the computer, my wife thinks I ought to power, uh, power my computers and everything with something that I'm doing. So if I'm lifting up milk jugs, uh, all day long, you know, what would it take to, uh, to, you know, to replicate, I think, what was it, a double A battery? What, what was your uh, calculation on that? Uh a double A battery lifting milk jugs uh, to about a meter high would be, I got 332 milk jugs, depending on what you're using for your number on the uh, capacity of a battery. So you better get busy. <laughs> All right. Oh, uh, perfect. Perfect. And, and I do encourage you to watch, uh, watch Quint's videos um, to, to really get a, a sense for, um, you know, what kind of efficiencies we're looking at here and um, how much it really takes. And I like those matrix references as well. You know, when he holds up the battery, we, we you know, you, sometimes you lose uh, sight of how much work it actually takes to human power uh, the gadgets around us. Um, thanks, Quint. Um, Mark Wilson. So I saw a couple of questions. Number one, um, there was one about the how long did it take to permit uh, that, that project to get the approvals um, and anything else that you wanted to hit um, uh, specific to the uh, Red John project. Yeah, so uh, we we started looking for sites back in 2015. Uh, we found Red Jot. We looked at over 130 locations or 130 30 sites over a two three year period. Uh, when we really started working on Red John, it was a uh, from then to now. It's from probably about four four to five years uh, to get from now to full permit. Now the main reason for that was. Uh, it went up for approval with the planners first time round, so we would have done it in three. Uh, but the in Scotland, the way it works, or the UK, uh, you have a, a, a committee with all the councillors, and uh, because it was at Loch Ness in such a scenic or, or globally known location, they were a bit a bit of a fear factor of of change, and uh, it took us two years to really educates probably is, is the right word of, of what pump storage is and all the benefits of it and how it would be so good for the local area so it took us a long time to work through that but we got there um our other two projects that are coming on stream are in areas that are still well known but not as well known as Loch Ness so we're hoping that's going to stand us in very good stead with the the next two projects that that come along um on the carbon offset We've worked, we've worked that, or the advisors have worked that with pump storage is an, an enabler. So it enables more renewables onto the system. But what it also does is it takes carbon off the system. So it's a combination of taking gas plants off the system and what the amount of, on we've worked it off with onshore and offshore wind that we can enable to bring onto the system. And in the UK, uh, at the moment, Something like uh, 130 million, I think it was last year. And that's a lot. That's a lot of money, but it's not in the big scheme of things. Is paid to developers to switch off their wind turbines, which I just think is absolute madness. Now, it, pump storage will stop that happening. It's as simple as that. So it enables renewables to run constantly, and all that excess energy, rather than switching turbines off and losing it you use it to pump the water up the mountain and 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 save it for when it's needed so that that's where we really see the uh, uh, just a, an obvious benefit of it is the question I was on the chat was what what about nuclear i mean nuclear's got a role to play in countries that like nuclear it's a choice uh and pump storage is not the silver bullet but um it will, as a as a proven technology, it will allow the renewables onto the system to help us get to net zero. I see it, we see it as a combination of utility scale battery for short duration, pump storage for daily to, to weekly, and then down the road, you're going to have green hydrogen, hopefully for interseasonal, meaning you'll maybe store energy in the summer and then use it in the winter for heating in Scotland or vice versa in hot countries for air conditioning um, is how we see it evolving. But uh, no, none of us has got a, can see into the future, but that, that's how, how we see it. 
Um, and then with the other question that I think stuck out for me is seawater pump storage. Um, I think it's a great idea. Uh, there was there was one in in Japan uh, that we looked at a while ago. It's fantastic to look at on the internet. It looks like something out like of James Bond. Um, but they actually closed that down. And um, I don't know if it was due to the what this the salt water um, causing like rust or whatever with the actual uh, equipment over a period of time. But uh, that would be. That'd be something that I think if that could be evolved, that would be a fantastic way to take it forward as well and give you so many more locations. Yeah, and, and having a look, yeah, having a look at those locations. Um, I posted that in the chat line. Um, that link is there for you on the resources page as well at surfacewater.biz um, slash pumped, um, where you can look it up and you can see they've had these algorithms and said, okay, well, let's look at sea level and let's look at how close uh, you can get some storage up above um, where it still makes economical sense. Um, so there is, there is, Bray, there is, um, I mean, the Japanese um, pump seawater pump storage was a pilot project really um, to see, to test the technology out. Um, there's been quite a bit of work done on that recently. I mean, in South Australia, there's the Coltana um, project that's been proposed, um, but there's also a project across in Chile um, that is COVID um, hoping it, um, it doesn't delay, but it was due to start construction this year. Um, so there are pump, seawater pump storage schemes out there. Um, it's just not as, a pro, as proven a technology because of the challenges of the seawater um, um, compared to the conventional, more, well, more onshore um, closed loop or even open loop um, pump storage. Yeah, no, thanks. And and again, each of these um, applications will have their limitations. I enjoyed seeing those pictures of things that I hadn't thought of before um, as far as where you can store energy. So um, we're on the hour mark. So those who uh, need to head off early, do take the poll question. Um, do give us your feedback on what you want to see more of. Um, we'll have everybody just say goodbye and uh, and give us, uh, give us your final closing remarks. Um, but if you need to run, fill that out for us. Um, you will get a recording link um, to, uh, to this entire recording um, on the YouTube channel. And you'll see also what's coming um, on uh, as, you, as, as we leave and close off here, you'll see what's coming in terms of courses and upcoming webinars. We'd love to have your attendance and participation in those. So uh, thanks so much, especially to Mark Wilson, who uh, got past the midnight hour as we were speaking here um, you know, for coming on board. These are volunteer presenters. Um, so we are doing this for the industry. Um, these expert presenters have come on board to talk to you today because they love what they do. Um, and we are are, uh, thrilled to be able to bring you this uh, content. So let's go kind of in uh, reverse order again. If we go uh, Mark Cordell, then Mark Wilson, then Quint, just closing remarks. Um, anything you want to say to the audience um, before we uh, shut down for the day? Picking up on a comment Mark made, pump storage is just one tool that we've got available to ourselves in the whole energy mix. There's a place for the other technologies as well, but um, obviously for the long dur term duration, um, we see pump storage as being a key player in that market. So, Thanks. and duration, long-term duration storage is going to become more and more critical um, as we go forward. Thanks. So. All right. Uh, Mark Wilson, closing remarks. Yeah, I uh, agree with Mark entirely. And uh, it's really, it's, let's make, try and all make as much noise about this technology as we can, because this, as my granny said to me, the, the baby that cries loudest gets the milk. And uh, this is a technology that should be out there, needs to be out there more. And uh, as, as Mark says, it's not the answer, but it's certainly going to help us get to net zero. Yeah, thanks. And we'll let uh, Quint uh, close this off. Um, if I have anything to say about it, um, we're going to have Quint on, uh, you know, doing some something with our our water work. I'm going to I'm going to come up with something that we can get you involved in as far as uh, rigging something up in your house to help demonstrate some of the things that we're going to be uh, uh, covering over the next uh, year or so. So any uh, any closing remarks, Quint? Oh, I just want to thank everybody for the opportunity. And I certainly learned from the other presenters here about the projects and, and the challenges and the uh, positive outlook here for the future. So appreciate that and an uh, opportunity to talk about my projects as well. So thank you very much. 
All right. Thank you. Subscribe to the Australian Water School for um, extra courses that you see coming up here, um, additional webinars that we'll be running, um, and give us your feedback on what you want to see more of. With that, we'll close off for the day from all around the globe to you all around the globe. Uh, we'll see you next time on our Australian Water School webinars. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. Subscribe by clicking the link below and click on the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases. For the latest in significant, innovative and critical advances in water science, technology and management, subscribe now to build your skills, enhance your technical knowledge and learn from leading experts in water, visit the australianwaterschool.com.au and discover our online training courses, both live and on demand.